Morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. You are very welcome to join us on our breakfast show here on Sky News. Police in Denmark have confirmed that three people shot dead and three critically injured when a gunman opened fire in one of Copenhagen's busiest shopping malls on Sunday evening. A 22-year-old Danish man has been charged with manslaughter and will appear in court later on today. He was pictured waving what appeared to be a rifle above his head. Police have not ruled out terrorism as a motive. Also coming up, we'll have the latest from Copenhagen. And as Boris Johnson faces further criticism of his leadership, we'll speak to the Education Minister, Will Quince. It is Monday, the 4th of July. Hundreds flee as a gunman opens fire in a shopping mall in Copenhagen. Witnesses describe the attack as pure terror. Pressure mounts on Boris Johnson are over allegations that he failed to act on warnings of sexual misconduct by his now resigned deputy chief whip. I'm here in Kyiv where President Zelensky remains defiant after this eastern city of Lysyshansk falls to Russian forces. I'm on the outskirts of Sydney where thousands of families have been forced to evacuate their homes after a month's worth of rain fell in just two days. Back at home, more chaotic scenes at airports around the country with hundreds of flights delayed or cancelled altogether. And drama at the British Grand Prix. Chinese driver Zhou Guinyo says his car's halo device saved his life. How dramatic was that? Also coming up on the programme for you this morning, we'll bring you the extraordinary story of the British Arctic explorer who was accused of spying against Russia and imprisoned in Siberia while on his travels. And the Royal Mail reports that 32 postmen and women are attacked by dogs every week. Bad dogs or bad owners? We'll get the view of a dog trainer. Morning, everybody. Three people have been shot dead in one of Copenhagen's biggest shopping centres. Police say that a 22-year-old Danish man has been arrested and charged over what the country's prime minister described as a cruel attack. At a media briefing late last night, they promised a massive presence in the Danish capital until they're certain that the gunman was acting alone. The attack happened at the Fields shopping centre near the centre of Copenhagen. Our Europe correspondent Siobhan Robbins reports. <laughs> In Copenhagen, people are running for their lives. Shoppers desperately trying to escape. And this is why. Inside a mall, a man can be seen pacing with a gun. Something grabs his attention and he runs off. Armed police are on the scene, trying to get people to safety. I saw people running away from the mall. We thought that we, it was some fans that were seeing Harry Styles, who was supposed to have a concert in half an hour. So, but after some time, the cops came, ambulance and the firemen came. I went outside to, to uh, reception, and I, and I asked what was happening, and they, some said it, there was a shooting. As police surround the building. Inside, they're tracking the gunman. People are told to hide. Officers later confirmed a 22-year-old Danishman had been arrested. They said terrorism couldn't be ruled out. What we're looking at now is whether we're dealing with just the suspects who we apprehended alone, or if this is something that was done with others. Pop star Harry Styles cancelled a concert he was playing nearby and in a message online said he was praying for all involved. This city now remains on high alert. Several people have died, several others have been injured. Victims in a shooting where the motive remains unclear. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News. Joining us now is uh, Will Quince, Minister of State for Children and Families. Uh, just a quick thought on that. Three people going about their business shopping, shot dead. It's totally appalling. And you know, my, my heart goes out in thoughts and prayers with the, the family of everyone involved. It's just 
truly awful. Yeah, a man appearing in court later on today, so we can't really say much more than that at this stage. But uh, we can talk about what on earth is going on with the sleaze in your party. Um, first of all, tell me, for the benefit of our viewers at home this morning, morning, wherever you're watching us, um, what are the responsibilities of a Deputy Chief Whip? So the, the Deputy Chief Whip is, is all about a bit pastoral care, but it's also about uh, ensuring discipline and the, the management and running of, um, of Parliament and, in, a sec, in effect, the House of Commons Chamber. Mm. So when you see somebody... Uh, like Mr Pincher behaving in the way that he did, I mean, does that not bring the whole process into disrepute? Well, it, 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 it's totally appalling. And I, I, was, I was shocked when I saw the news on late on Thursday night and then saw the resignation and then the whip being withdrawn on, on the Friday. And the, the reality is Parliament is 650 MPs and what I see day in, day out is people working hard for their constituents and to try and make this country a better place for not just their constituents, but uh, everyone so children have better life chances than their, their parents. And there's no question that you know, allegations of this nature, and of course we've got to have due pro process of, to follow, does huge damage to the reputation and trust uh, in Parliament. And of course that hurts us all. So what do you do about it? Well, it's right that due process follows. The first thing is it's really important that people uh, make complaints and call out behaviour that is, in this case, you know, what appears to be should totally to the police? totally unacceptable. If the allegation is serious, of course, I would encourage people to go to the police. They should also go to the parliamentary authorities, in particular if it happens on the parliamentary estate, because that's exactly the way, through a formal complaint process, that action can be taken, as it was in this case, with the Prime Minister and the Chief Whip taking the decision to withdraw the whip. Mm. I mean, it's charming to have you uh, here today. Um, not particularly well known to my viewers, but uh, come back whenever you want. Um, I'm reading in the paper this morning that junior ministers are being sent out to deal with the press um, and to talk to viewers back home because senior ministers just can't face um, defending people like the former Deputy Chief Whip. Well, I'm certainly not going to defend the former Deputy Chief Whip. The allegations are incredibly serious and I'm uh, appalled uh, by them. But I, I, th that isn't the case uh, today because I was booked in four days ago, in fact, five days ago, I think it was, to talk about a very important childcare and early and we'll years come to that. announcement. We're going to, going to come to that. Um, but, but, of course, the, the actions, as are alleged, are indefensible. I don't think you'll see anybody come forward and say anything other than that. And given um, you've, you've, we've all heard the allegations and read about them over the weekend, do you think they're serious enough for the police to get involved? So I, I think that is a matter for the police, but I think it's important... Only if, that, we, only well, if they're approached. Uh, of course. And I think the key thing is that we create an environment where everybody feels that if they witness or if they are the victim of sexual assault or predatory behaviour of this nature in line with these allegations, that they feel able to go to the police and the authorities, because that's exactly how investigations can follow and due process take its course. One well, wonders why the Prime Minister gave him a job. Well, look, it's, it's a fair question, and, and I, I anticipated that, and I, I spoke with Number 10 both yesterday and today, and I, I asked them firmly and clearly for an answer on this, and I've been given categorical assurance that the Prime Minister was not aware of any serious uh, specific allegation with regards to uh, the former Deputy Chief Whip. Seems that lots of people around the Prime Minister were, but the Prime Minister himself wasn't. So, look, all, all I can say is what I've, I've heard, and that's that the, the Prime Minister wasn't aware of any specific allegation or complaint with regards to the former Deputy Chief Whip. And I think you know, these cases are hard because, it, like any professional organisation, you can't act on rumour or gossip. And, as you know, in Westminster, there is a lot of rumour or gossip. It's something I try to sort of stay clear of. But it's why it's also so important that where people do witness something which is clearly falling well below the, the, the standard behaviour, we should uh, rightly expect from members of Parliament and those who work on the parliamentary estate that it's reported and we encourage everybody to come forward, and whether that's the police or the parliamentary authorities, so action can be taken, like it was in this case, with the Chief Whip and the Prime Minister the very next day withdrawing the whip. It took them 21 hours, though. Well, it, 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 I don't think that's entirely fair, because I think the Deputy Chief Whip resigned the previous evening, and then the next day, I believe, a, a, for, a formal complaint was made, and it was on the basis of that complaint being made that the whip was then withdrawn. Do you think he should resign his seat? So that, that's, not, that's not a matter for me. And I no, think... I'm, I'm interested so, in your view. So it, 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 we've got to let due process follow and follow its course. So I would encourage the first thing is everybody and anybody who has witnessed or who has been the victim of um, behaviour that they believe to be below the standard expected, then they should report it. And then that's a matter for the police and the parliamentary authorities. It, I, the reason I ask is because I heard from the um, former MP for Tiverton and Honiton who lost his... who actually was forced to resign his seat. He feels it's double standards and there's one rule for what happened with him, what he was watching on his phone in the chamber and the physical, alleged physical assaults that this guy's been up to. 
I, I think every case has to be taken on a case by case basis. Clearly, the, um, the, the behaviour there was unacceptable also. And do I think Neil Parrish made the right decision? Yes, I do. Ultimately, it was his decision to resign his seat. In this case now, the whip's been withdrawn, there will be a formal investigation. And the key thing is, Kay, that as many people and anybody who has witnessed or had experience as a, a, a victim of any kind of sexual predatory behaviour comes forward and reports that. It is once again challenging the um, ethical judgment, though, of the Prime Minister, is it not? I, I hear what you say, that uh, the Prime Minister says he doesn't know about the actual details. But if we look back at some of the other stuff that's been going on, not least Lord Guide, who was the um, ethics advisor to the Prime Minister, he resigned 19 days ago. At the moment, he doesn't have an ethics advisor. Uh, that is the case. I've, I've no doubt the Prime Minister intends to uh, appoint one. But, you know, I, I think on this case, if you look at what happened in terms of an allegation was made, the very same... and, and uh, a complaint made, the very same day the Chief Whip and the Prime Minister withdrew the whip, you've now got to let due process... I understand the allegations are being disputed, so you've got to let due process follow its course. But I'm absolutely confident that the investigation will take place and then the appropriate action will be taken. And if any of these claims against him are proven, he should then lose his seat? Well, that, that's, a, that's a matter for Parliament, and we have clear processes and procedures in place around recall. Yeah, but you wouldn't be happy sitting next to him, would you, in the chamber? Well, it's, it's, it's not a matter for me, and, and it's, and it's no, absolutely wrong that, that any individual... I understand that, but I'm interested MP... to know what your well, view look, is, look, because I'm sure a lot of my viewers this morning will think, well, I wouldn't want to sit next to him if he I, I think, I think in that the, the allegations are shocking and appalling. Uh, and, and I can understand why colleagues uh, would indeed feel that way. But in terms of who represents a seat in Parliament, that is ultimately up to the constituents of, uh, of that individual Member of Parliament. But of course there are clear procedures and processes around recall in place. But I think we're jumping the gun a bit because there is due process and we've got to make sure that investigation take? follows. Uh, it will all depend on the length of the investigation and that will be no doubt in the hands of the police and the parliamentary authorities. OK, so you think the police will get involved? I, I don't know, Kay. I don't okay. know. It all depends on who comes forward. Talk to me about um, your um, planned childcare can I call them reforms? Yeah, you certainly can. So this is, this is all about improving the accessibility, the availability and, importantly, the affordability of childcare and early years education. So it's about encouraging more childminders into the market, which we know has been a, a declining sector over the past few years. It's about ratio reforms. We've got a consultation on ratio reform and fairer funding. It's about an extra £10 million pumped in to maintain nursery schools. Uh, and, it, and it's also about generally just looking at what more we can do over the next few years around childcare and early years education, whilst, of course, maintaining that high quality Quality, uh, ensuring that safety is paramount. Fewer staff, though. Um, s s fewer staff in, in what way? In terms of ratios? Yeah. Well, look, what we're proposing is moving from a one to four currently to the Scottish model, which is one to five. And it'll be up to each individual setting. It's not a, a, a target, it's a very much a legal cap, it's a maximum. Uh, and it is designed to give uh, individual settings and providers that flexibility as to how they safely provide that high quality care within their setting. Why do it if it's not going to save any money? Well, I didn't say it wouldn't save money. In fact, if, pe if people follow through with it, it could save money. And we've, we've modelled what that would look like. But at the moment, some settings, and the great thing about our earliest setting, I mean, we have 97% that are good or outstanding, so we have some of the highest quality earliest education uh, in the world. It's about giving them that flexibility, whether it's around staff training or covering lunch breaks, so parents don't turn up that day because of staff sickness or whatever else, that, that um, they aren't going to be able to have a child have a place in that setting in that day. So it's not saying they have to move to these ratios, it's giving them the option to do so. And, and that's why we're consulting on it, and I very much want to hear the views of the sector. Well, you say that, but I mean, you went to Paris with our tomorrow on Friday, NFI, by the way, um, and you said that um, it's not going to save any money and it's not a silver bullet. So I said it's not a silver bullet and I didn't say it's not going to save money. I said it could save money, but it's not a silver bullet in terms of dramatically reducing the cost for parents. It's more about flexibility for settings, which will then ultimately, in the medium to long term, could save money. But it's part of a wider package of measures, including, for example, ensuring that parents who could and should be eligible to, to in some cases, thousands of pounds of government support through entitlements, through tax-free childcare, and, of course, through the universal credit offer, which is 85% of childcare costs, making sure that they're accessing the entitlements that they're currently not receiving. And in some cases, it's hundreds of thousands of people that could and should be eligible for this funding, which could be up to you know, several thousand pounds a year. So will it save my viewers money or not? So it, it, what, what it will do, so ratios will in the medium to long term save money, yes. But the key thing today actually is about you know, hundreds of thousands of people who aren't accessing the government support, be it the two or the three and four year old offer, or indeed tax free childcare and universal credit, making sure that they're getting the entitlement that they should be at the moment, which can be worth up to several thousand pounds. Now, you have a little bit of a conflict of interest in that your missus is a teacher, she it's wants true. 12%, your boss wants to give a 9%. 
that's going to be tricky, isn't it? At home over dinner. Well, you, you're, 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 yeah, I'm going to be in a tricky situation with a, a wife as a, as a teacher and a, and a, and a senko. Um, so it's something we don't discuss at, at home, Kay. But you know, you're right. I mean, these are these are difficult times, and we know that there's the global, global inflationary pressures, and the government has to tread that path very carefully. We have independent uh, salary and pay review bodies, and it's important that we wait for those recommendations and, and don't prejudge them. OK. I can't let you go without talking dogs. We, yes, we're both yes. Dogs. So look at his face light up as soon as I Irish say setters. There we go, there we go. <laughs> we're doing a story later on about posties being attacked by yep. dogs. Apparently, um, something like... Oh, thousands are attacked um, every year. Are they bad dogs or bad owners? Well, I, I, it's, it's probably a mixture of the two in terms of it's really important, as, as you know, Kay, when you, you get a dog, that you invest the time to train them properly. I think there are steps that everyone can take at home. So, you know, when we've had a dog at home, and when you, as you know, we look after our neighbours, and when I've had them with my parents, you can put guards over your letterbox, which can prevent these things from happening, like cages that catch mm -hmm. the post. And also, if you alert the post office, they'll put a red sticker against your address to, so they know that there's a dog on the premises. So I think it's about being a responsible dog owner. Mm, OK. I always think there's no such thing as bad dogs, just bad Owners. Um, thank you very much indeed, Minister, for Pleasure. joining Thanks us. For much appreciated. Me. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's bring you uh, an update from Copenhagen. I should be the police chief has said this morning there is no indication that the attack in a shopping mall was actually an attack of terror, though I'm sure people involved were absolutely terrified. He revealed that one of the three people who was shot dead was a uh, Russian residing in Denmark. Looking at the front pages for you now, the Metro leads on number 10's struggle to defend claims the Prime Minister did not know about the Conservative, with Chris Pincher's alleged reputation for groping. PM facing Cabinet backlash over Pincher, the headline in The Telegraph for you this morning. The Times claims the upset has revitalised plans to oust Boris Johnson. Austerity-driven cuts have left over one and a half million children from single-parent families in poverty. That's according to research in The Guardian. The Daily Mail, meanwhile, says 22,000 crime suspects failed to turn up to court. That's in their exclusive on Monday. In some pictures, the only way is Essex star, who was involved in a car crash in Turkey, which killed her boyfriend, Jake McLean. And happy scorch of July, says the Daily Star, as it predicts we could see temperatures of up to 36 degrees this coming week. Still to come on the programme for you this morning, as Russia claims victory in the strategically important Ukrainian city of Lishchansk, it'll be I'll, be... I'll be joined, I should say, by a military expert Michael Clark to assess whether the war has now swung in Vladimir Putin's favour. Then joined by a criminal barrister as her colleagues prepare to go on strike for a second week. And in the next hour, we'll get more reaction to the latest scandal engulfing the Conservative Party with Shadow Cabinet Office Minister Jenny Chapman. The Ukrainian president has issued a defiant statement after Russian forces occupied the last remaining city in the eastern city our eastern state of Luhansk. In his nightly address, he said his forces would reclaim all of the land lost to Russia. The Shanks was the last remaining Ukrainian held city in the eastern Luhansk region. It's captured by uh, Russian forces. will be seen as a landmark victory for Vladimir Putin in his attempts to take the entire Donbass region. Sally standing by for us in Kiev this morning. This is bad news, isn't it, for the Ukrainians? It certainly is, Kay. Uh, it's certainly a significant moment uh, in this war and I would say one that many expected uh, in recent days. Uh, and it certainly seems like it was a tactical decision by the Ukrainian forces to withdraw uh, yesterday, uh, albeit under heavy um, fire, uh, because there was a danger that they were going to become surrounded by Russian forces in that city of Lysyshansk, uh, thousands of them, which would have been an <clears throat> absolute uh, disaster. Now, in his nightly address, President Zelensky remained defiant, as you say, uh, but he's also called for more weapons, because the main issue for Ukrainian forces here is they were completely outgunned by the Russians in Lysyshansk. Now, of course, that means that the whole Luhansk region is now controlled by Russia, which is half of the Donbass. Uh, and Russia has made it clear that its primary goal is to control the entire industrial Donbass region. So it will now turn its eyes to the Donetsk region, uh, which Ukraine largely still controls huge parts of it. The fighting in the Donbass 
is far from over. And in fact, yesterday we did already see some shelling uh, of the city of Slovyansk. Slovyansk and Krematorsk are the two biggest cities in the Donetsk region, which remain under Ukrainian control, but certainly was heavily shelled yesterday uh, in Slovyansk <clears throat> with at least six people, including a child, uh, killed. Uh, so Ukrainian forces will now be preparing new defensive lines. Uh, both sides have suffered heavy losses. The big question now is whether the Ukrainians can defend against this Russian advance and whether Russia can maintain this momentum. OK, thanks so much, Ali. Thank you. Thousands of people living um, in or around Australia's biggest city have been forced to evacuate from their homes after heavy rains flooded several suburbs. Let's find out more. Should we? Nicole is standing by for us. So much rain, Nicole. Good morning. So we've had extraordinary rains here uh, all around Sydney. I'm in the northwest of the city, but even manoeuvring around here has become very difficult. It's flooded fields and houses, businesses, cars underwater. Uh, you can see one of the major uh, bridges just outside of Sydney behind me. Our cameraman is going to show you how far that flood water extends at least a mile. It's broken its banks. It's submerged the bridge. And people in this area, when you speak to them, they say that they're expecting things to get much worse before they get better. And that's because these rivers, the, the flood levels are still increasing and they're expected to peak overnight. We've seen the emergency crews out and about. Some 30,000 people have been told to either evacuate from their homes or to get their flood plans ready so that when the crews say it's time to get out, they're ready to do it. We've also seen them out on boats already having to get some people, uh, some families out of their houses when the waters have risen too quickly. The amazing thing here, though, is this has been going on for months and months. This isn't a one-off flood. Some of these areas have had three or four floods just this year. So they're exhausted, they're tired. They say they clean up from one flood and then suddenly another flood arrives. Remembering also at the beginning of the year, we had that massive flood event up on the north coast of New South Wales in Lismore. 10,000 people in that area are still homeless. So everyone here is frustrated that the flooding is still continuing. They say that the state government and the federal government needs to come up with a plan to protect them. But they're living in low-lying, flood-prone areas. And right now, Australia is in the middle of a La Nina weather event. So that means that the entire east coast of Australia is being constantly hammered by these extreme weather events. Now, climate scientists are saying that this could continue for another couple of months over the winter and into the spring, so people are bracing for even more flood events. Two years of La Nina so far, and now they're saying that this could extend into a third year. So a really pretty dramatic scene that we have here, not only on the outskirts of Sydney, but stretching along the coast. And uh, as I said, emergency crews and officials are warning people to stay at home, to cancel their school holidays and just wait for these floodwaters to drop. OK, thanks, Nicole. Thank you. More than a metre of rain in 24 hours and lots more to come, we're told. Uh, almost 32,000 people have been told to leave their home or to prepare to leave their home. It's the fourth time, as Nicole was saying, um, in just 18 months that the people in that area have uh, had to face um, challenges with flooding. Uh, meantime, uh, back home, and there have been more chaotic scenes at airports around the country with hundreds of flights delayed or cancelled altogether. Some passengers had to wait hours to collect their bags, which led to luggage being abandoned on carousels. Airlines have until Friday to take advantage of a government amnesty to hand back landing slots and change their schedules without facing penalties. At least six people have been killed, eight injured, after a glacier collapsed on a popular hiking trail in the Italian Alps. Rescuers could not immediately determine how many people were in the area and are now checking car registrations in the car park to try to clarify the numbers. 
A Romanian tourist has been killed in a second fatal shark attack off the coast of Egypt in recent days. A 68-year-old Austrian woman died on Friday after reportedly being attacked by a Mako shark while swimming in the Red Sea near the resort town of Hogada. Formula One motor racing at Silverstone this weekend produced a couple of terrifying moments. Two big crashes within hours of each other. Experts said both could have been deadly, but for a life-saving bit of kit called a halo. Kamali reports. This is the heart-stopping moment that could have brought tragedy to Silverstone. His car flipped upside down. Formula One driver Zhou Guan Yu is only saved from horrific injury, or worse, by a relatively new safety feature known as a halo. Introduced in 2018, the halo is a semicircular crossbar made of titanium and joined to the front of the car, encasing the driver's head. It can take the weight of a double-decker bus, but it's proven controversial. I think the traditionalists said, look, they're open cockpit cars. We don't like it because of the aesthetics. And the fans didn't like it because they couldn't see as much of the drivers. But it's just proved to be an absolute lifesaver. And yet, just hours before Guan Yu's crash, this happened. The halo doing its job. That is a life saved unequivocally. This was in Formula 2. The halo is all that stands between the head of driver Roy Nissany and the car on top of him. And back in 2020, Roman Grosjean walked away unhurt from this, shielded by, yes, his halo. So while some racing purists may not like it, it's clear that the halo is doing what it was designed to do, save lives. Kamali Melbourne, Sky News. Quick look at the weather for you now. Warm memories wherever you go. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Warmer and drier, but the north can still expect rain at times. Mainly dry and fairly mild right now, though. But there are showers around, mostly, as I said, in the north and the west. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. A uh, quick look at what's happening in Wimbledon. Cameron Norrie is the sole British player left in the singles at SW19, heading into the second week of the tournament. Yes, good lad. Uh, he reached the last eight of a Grand Slam tournament for the first time after a straight sets win over the American Tommy Paul. Heather Watson's best ever run at Wimbledon came to an end after she lost to Germany's Julie or Jules Niemeyer, I should say. Uh, and looking at some of the other papers for you this morning, we have this picture in the Telegraph of a new species of water lily that's been discovered at Kew Gardens, and it's the largest ever to be recorded. Uh, could have existed a million years ago. This particular species was only uncovered after it was grown from a packet of seeds donated by some Bolivian researchers. How cool is that? Uh, the Guardian. It was the return of the infamous soapbox races this weekend. Racers are tasked with creating their non-motorised vehicles that are both able to make it through the course whilst also being as wacky as possible. Winner judged on performance as well as inventiveness and appearance and whether or not they actually finish the race. Surprised you've not got moving pictures of that. We'll try and find you some. And finally, in the Express, it looks like someone didn't get their morning coffee captured on India's Ramthambore National Park. The picture shows a female tiger. There she is, Krishna, uh, lashing out at her mate. There you go. Not sure whether she caused any problems or not. Um, that's the express for you. Uh, still to come on the programme, we'll have more reaction as a strategically significant Ukrainian city falls to the Russians. That to come. Morning again, everybody. Thanks for having your breakfast with us here on Sky News this morning. Tomorrow here in just a second. But first, let's tell you what's been happening in Denmark overnight. Three people have been killed in a shooting at a shopping mall in the capital. A 22-year-old Danish man has been arrested and charged with the attack. Police said this morning he acted alone and shot his victims at random. President Zelensky has said Ukraine will reclaim all of its land lost in the war as the eastern city of Lyschank falls to Russian forces. 
Labour demanding Boris Johnson sets out exactly what he knew about allegations of inappropriate behaviour by the MP Chris Pincher before he was appointed to the Tory Whip's office. The Education Minister told this programme Downing Street had received no specific complaint. Well, let's tell you a little bit more about what the Minister's been telling us this morning. He told us that the allegations of groping levelled against the former Deputy Chief Whip damaged the reputation and trust of Parliament. Will Quince also told me he was sure the Prime Minister had no knowledge of previous allegations made against Chris Pincher before he appointed him to the role. There's no question that you know, allegations of this nature, and of course we've got to have due pro process of, to follow, does huge damage to the reputation and trust uh, in Parliament, and of course that hurts us all. I asked them firmly and clearly for an answer on this, and I've been given categorical assurance that the Prime Minister was not aware of any serious uh, specific allegation with regards to uh, the former Deputy Chief Whip. Seems that lots of people around the Prime Minister were, but the Prime Minister himself wasn't. But so, look, all, all I can say is what I've, I've heard, and that's that the, the Prime Minister wasn't aware of any specific allegation or complaint with regards to the former Deputy Chief Whip. Tamara's here and he was saying the allegations are appalling. He's saying they're appalling, that he's not going to defend the Deputy Chief Whip and that no-one else is either. Now, there have been a slew of allegations uh, surfacing in the weekend papers um, about Chris Pincher, dating from the last decade, but many of them occurred um, allegedly quite recently, 2019, 2020, 2021. And you're seeing now Conservative MPs unwilling to defend him, although uh, he, through his lawyers, has denied any inappropriate behaviour in many of those cases. The question is, did the Prime Minister know anything about it? Uh, Will Quince, the minister we just had on, said that he's received a categorical assurance that the Prime Minister didn't and that he, the Prime Minister can't act on the basis of rumours. Downing Street today tell me that this appointment was referred to the propriety and ethics team at the Cabinet Office. They looked into it. They didn't raise any objections and that is what the Prime Minister acts on. But when you've got allegations in the newspapers, particularly in the Sunday Times, that the Prime Minister was warned personally, was told personally that people had been victims of inappropriate behaviour by Mr Pincher, um, if anything surfaces to suggest that Downing Street's version of events is not correct when they say the Prime Minister didn't know of any specific allegations, then this could yet get more damaging for Boris Johnson, who is uh, facing a grilling by MPs on Wednesday at the Liaison Committee, I think one of his least favourite yeah. appointments. <laughs> And the Liaison Committee is all of the, it's all the chairs, chairs of the other committees. committees, many of whom are his vocal critics. OK, um, we'll see you at nine o'clock for tomorrow's take. Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, let's return to the war in Ukraine and get more reaction to the fall of the eastern Ukrainian city of Lyshansk to uh, Russian forces. Joining us now is the former director of the Royal United Services Institute, Rusi, and that's Professor Michael Clark. Hello, Professor. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. However you look at it, this is bad news for Ukraine. <clears throat> Uh, well, it's fairly inevitable news. Um, when Severodonetsk fell, which is the city on the other side of the river, Lyshyshansk was going to be the next point to defend. The Ukrainians had actually quite strong defensive positions in Lyshyshansk on the high ground overlooking the river. But the Russians actually, for once, were able to manoeuvre in ways they haven't been able to from the beginning of this war um, and get behind them. And so last week, there was a, a news blackout in Kiev for, for a few days, and we all thought that's probably because they were withdrawing, and they were. So they haven't, in a sense, been beaten in Lysychansk, but they've withdrawn from it because they couldn't allow themselves to be surrounded. So, yes, it's a loss, but the uh, Ukrainians certainly are not losing too many troops now because they've withdrawn in good order. It's been a fighting withdrawal, and now they seem to be out, and they'll be moving back westwards, I suspect, towards uh, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, which is the next strong point that they will want to defend. Um, is it now also, though, inevitable that, at least for now, they will lose the whole of the Donbass region? No. <clears throat> um, they've certainly lost uh, Luhansk, which is the smaller of the two oblasts, the two regions that make up the whole Donbass. Um, so that's gone for, the, for now. Uh, the, the bigger one is Donetsk. Um, and the Russians or Russian forces occupy about half of Donetsk. They occupy the eastern half, but not the western half. And they won't get the whole of Donetsk until they take Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, which will be quite a, um, a struggle for them. So, uh, yes, this is, a, this is a victory for Russia. This is the mo mo most significant advance and victory they've had since uh, March the uh, 25th, I think it was, when they announced that they were uh, making the Donbass their main uh, line of, of, of uh, offensive. But they have said they want the whole of the Donbass. And they don't get that 
until they take Slavyansk and particularly Kramatorsk. Uh, what about Snake Island? Now, we remember Snake Island from the very beginning of this <clears> war, <throat> don't we, uh, when one of the young uh, sailors stood up to the, uh, the Russians who were telling him and others to surrender. Um, yeah. Why have the Russians given back Snake Island? Or it certainly appears that that's what they've done. Yeah, well, they've just abandoned it because the position there was untenable. They were establishing um, air defence assets on Snake Island to give them control of the airspace above it and also, by implication, also the, the sea lanes in and out of Odessa. But it was just, just within artillery range of um, these new guns that the Ukrainians have got, almost certainly the French Caesar guns, the 155 millimeter ones, with a special shell, which gives it a little bit of extra range. It was just within artillery range. And although the Russians had air defense and missile defense, there, there's no defense against artillery shells. They're too small and they travel too quickly. And so the Ukrainians just bombarded them with artillery on Snake Island to the point where the Russians simply couldn't stay. And they, they left last week. They left one of their air defence missile batteries um, and one of their radars intact, which they shouldn't have done. The following day, they tried to bomb it, uh, to bomb their own facility so the Ukrainians couldn't use it. And they, they dropped four bombs and missed with three of them, hit with one of them. Um, three fell in the sea, one of them fell on the island. It's not clear whether that facility is still um, uh, operational, whether they did hit what they were aiming at on the island. Um, the Ukrainians probably won't occupy the island in any force because anyone on Snake Island is vulnerable to some sort of attack. But certainly the Russians now don't have it, so it makes Odessa that little bit safer. How is Ukraine and, and the, uh, the West going to get this grain out of the country. The silos are full. Uh, they're about to start bringing in the grain again and there's nowhere to put it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's between 20 and 25 million tonnes of grain stacked up in Odessa that can't get out. Um, in a couple of months, by uh, the end of August, there'll be another 70,000 tonnes, which will either be destroyed or will be backed up against that. And there's 300 to 400 million people in the world waiting for it who are in food poverty of one sort or another, some of them on the verge of starvation. The only way, the only way that significant num amounts of grain will get out of Odessa is if the grain carriers, the ships, are allowed out in some sort of protected convoy. Now, that would depend on the agreement of uh, Russia, uh, which won't come without major concessions on sanctions, and the agreement of Turkey. The other variation on that idea um, because you, you, know, you can't move enough grain over land. It has to move by sea to move in the tonnages that is required. So the only variation is some sort of international uh, body, maybe sanctioned at the UN, possibly, um, simply to go in and take the grain out um, and protect convoys going in and out uh, and dare the Russians to attack it, just dare them to try to stop it happening in the in the face of a humanitarian need. That's another possibility. It's the only way it might work, but very, very dangerous. Um, and it would require some demining, not too difficult, actually, of the of the mines around Odessa. That's that's a, a straightforward job, but somebody would have to do it. The British and the French have got good demining assets. Uh, you know, NATO countries could demine uh, lanes out of Odessa Ships could come through those lanes, be protected all the way down through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean and dare the Russian Black Sea Fleet to interfere. Yeah, but that's a big risk, is it, isn't it, for it Ukraine? Is. Why it would is. they clear the mines away when they would just potentially be clearing a channel for the Russian ships to come in? Well, they can close it again. <clears throat> I mean, you, if you clear a minefield, I mean, in the Second World War, Britain had uh, Malta very, very heavily mined, and we had we had lanes through the minefields. We got our ships in and out all the time. So um, uh, you don't have to clear a whole minefield in order to get ships out. You simply have to clear a lane, and then you can close the lane again afterwards. That, that's not a particular problem, but you need the assets to do it. You need modern mining ships, so countermining ships and mine layers in order to do it. So it can be done. But the Ukrainians probably can't do it on their own. They would have to do it with NATO assets. And the whole thing would increase the danger of a confrontation, of course, between NATO forces and Russian forces. OK, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us, as always. Much appreciated.
More chaotic scenes at airports surround the country with hundreds of flights delayed or cancelled altogether. Some passengers had to wait hours to collect their bags, which led to luggage being abandoned on carousels. Let's find out more, should we? Maddie standing by at Heathrow for us. Uh, Maddie, I was speaking um, to a colleague this morning who was telling, um, telling me that she knew it was going to be a challenge in the baggage reclaim hall when they got there and people were lying on the floor. Good morning, Kay. Yes, it has been a chaotic summer for travellers. There have been delays, queues and cancellations at nearly every airport and airline. Um, and just last week at Heathrow, first of all, there was, there was a shortage of security staff that meant that flights were cancelled. And then they were, the airport's fueling systems had a problem, which meant there were even more delays and those, those bags just piled up. But one thing the government has done to try and ease this situation is it's relaxed the rules on airport slots at airports, um, airline slots at airports even, meaning that uh, for up until this Friday, airlines can change their schedules and cancel flights without penalty, without losing those very valuable slots next year, which will allow them to fly far more manageable schedules, at least until their um, staffing levels have recovered and, and built back up. And the idea is to avoid more of those last-minute cancellations that have caused so much chaos as travellers have turned up at the airport only to discover their flight isn't flying. Um, now, that's been welcomed by Heathrow. They say it will bring much needed clarity and um, uh, for, for consumers, give them more confidence when they're travelling. But it does mean that this week, until that deadline, we might see more cancellations announced. Good to see you. Thanks very much. We'll be speaking to a travel expert. Uh, if you're planning to go on holiday over the next uh, few weeks, especially with the kids as school breaks up, um, any top tips on how to make sure that you don't get caught up in all of that aggro at the airports. Uh, meantime, with reports of continued industrial action across a number of sectors in the UK, there are warnings that Britain could be heading towards a summer of discontent. Barristers are set to continue their strike into a second week with gatherings of lawyers expected at courts around the country. Joining us now is Kirsty Brimelow, who is a criminal barrister. Hi, Kirsty. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. Uh, the government say they're offering you 15%. You're not having any more. Yes, the government actually isn't offering 15%. What it's offering is 15%, which will reach barristers in around a year or two years' time, because the increase would relate to new cases only. <laughs> Obviously, currently, we have a backlog of about 58,000 cases. And so the concern of the criminal bar, and the reason, one of the reasons why the criminal barristers are taking this action, is because they just simply are unlikely to be sufficient barristers left in two years' time. Uh, we've seen uh, a quarter of junior barristers stop uh, practising in criminal law over the past five years. And obviously legal aid, as has been widely reported, has been slashed um, by 40% since 2016. And so the 15% doesn't go anywhere near to reverse some of those cuts. It also doesn't address the 23% collapse in barristers' earnings during the pandemic. I would add that the money is there. The government saved £240 million on legal aid during the pandemic. And it's also profited since 2010 by selling off the courts uh, and reducing judges' sitting days. It's, it's profited in over £200 million since then. And that actually is one of the reasons why we've hit such a crisis that we are now in. There was an independent review uh, which was published um, back in 2021 where the independent review, which had been governed by the, which had been commissioned by the government, set out that the, the system is in crisis and that there needed to be an immediate increase of a minimum of 15% annually. And obviously we'll be trotting on uh, to around a year's time since that report and the proposal by the government will come into play in another two years. OK, but you've stopped taking legal aid cases now, haven't you, as an industry? Yes, so the uh, ballot, which uh, concluded uh, on the 20th of June, uh, has decided that members will not take uh, further legal aid cases, nor cover uh, cases of their colleagues, and also be taking days of action during this month. Um, but that, how does that help the backlog? It doesn't help the backlog, unfortunately. It's a, a short-term 
attempt at pressurising uh, to have a long-term effect. The system's in crisis and we have been trying to communicate really since the autumn, since the publication of the independent review, which supported what criminal barristers already know, but it's fallen on deaf ears. And so barristers have been driven uh, to take this measure. Um, and how long are you going to go on strike for? Well, currently, um, we'd, we're, we are taking action this week for three days. So today, tomorrow and Wednesday, and then it will be four days next week, five days the week after, and then alternate weeks thereafter. Good to talk to you. Thanks for taking the um, time to join us on the programme this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Police in Ohio have released body cam footage showing the moment a man was shot dead after he fled from officers. Police fired around 90 rounds at him. Here's Joe Pike. More than 60 gunshot wounds were found on Jalen Walker's body. after officers fired a barrage of around 90 rounds. When they make that most critical decision to point their firearm at another human being and pull the trigger, they've got to be ready to explain why they did what they did. They need to be able to articulate what specific threats they were facing. And that goes for every round that goes down the barrel of their gun. And they need to be held to account. The 25-year-old was unarmed when he was shot. A firearm was found in his vehicle. Earlier, during a car chase, police believe Mr Walker fired from the driver's seat. A casing was found close by. He later fled his vehicle wearing a ski mask. Police tried to stop him with tasers, then moved on to firearms. In the city of Akron, protests, but from Jalen Walker's family, a call for calm. There are no words to describe what we just saw, but we are begging you. That family is begging you. Jalen is begging you to stay peaceful. We will get nowhere with violence and destruction, but we will with measured and calm dialogue. Eight officers are now on paid leave as an investigation attempts to understand why another unarmed black man has been shot and killed by police. Joe Pike, Sky News. At home now in yesterday's British Grand Prix at Silverstone will no doubt be remembered as uh, one of the races of the Formula One season and will serve as a timely reminder of how advancements in the sports technology can save lives. Alfa Romeo driver Zhou Guan Yu did not suffer serious injuries despite being involved in that first lap crash that saw his car flip multiple times before skidding upside down across the gravel on the halo device, which has been the subject of much discussion since it was introduced in 2018. Last year, Lewis Hamilton credited the halo for saving him after he was involved in a crash at the Italian Grand Prix with uh, rival Max Verstappen and many other occasions as well. Uh, joined now by Tony Jardine, who is member of the British Racing Drivers Club. Hi, it's good to see you. And let's not forget the catch fence as well, which really saved um, a lot of those spectators. Yes, it did indeed. Uh, and that was, um, wasn't was mentioned too much, that debris fencing there, um, having having watched some of the footage from some of the spectators on their iPhones, it, it, was, it was frightening. Uh, you know there will be investigations as to as to why when the car went through the gravel trap it actually flipped over the tire wall um that flipped it up into the air and into the debris fence which was the final amount of the cash but also on here kate you'll notice when going upside down the roll hoop behind this driver's head has actually sheared off putting even more pressure on the halo uh, to you know, ensure that he survived. Then the car is actually trapped between the tire wall and the debris fencing, which took him, it's the reason that it took them a long time to get him out of that 
a car. But it, it's done its job, and the FIA over the last 10 years have improved safety so much. I mean, even earlier in the day, and you can see this is George Russell here, who is Lewis Hamilton's teammate. He rushed over to try and, and help the other driver as well. Um, but the FIA, as I say, have made so many improvements over the last 10 years. The hands device, which holds the helmet into place so that your head doesn't go too far forward to prevent you breaking your neck. It, essentially, around the driver, it's like a, a safety cocoon. And you think there's about 40 G going into the energy. And there's the you know, the shot from the spectators there, they're ducking out of the way and the debris didn't come through on them. Also to point out, Roman Grosjean last year in Bahrain had the most horrendous accident when the car went through the Armco barrier. Now, it's absolutely certain if the halo device had not been on that car, he would have been killed because the car also uh, caught fire and um, he, he was very lucky to emerge through the flames with just um, burnt hands. So... The safety in Formula One, the advancements that they've made, and especially when you see it on a high-speed circuit like Silverstone, very exciting, of course, but very high-speed track. Um, the halo is, you know, well, all praise the halo. Yes, yeah, so it's sort of a ring of titanium, isn't it? And just to give our viewers uh, an idea, apparently it could take the weight of a double-decker bus on top yes. of it, and it certainly needed that um, yesterday. What did you think about George running over to make sure the other guy was OK um, and then not being allowed to take part in the race? It was most unfortunate for George because his first instinct was to go and help his fellow driver, of course, rushing over. The rules say that if you receive assistance to your car... Uh, before a restart, then you're not allowed to restart. And he had received assistance. He wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about Joe in the car and, and trying to help him get out. And we know from junior races that he's done that in karting, for example, um, with other drivers have gone off, he's got out of his cart to go and help them. Um, it's a shame because it turns out that George's car um, only had a left rear puncture. It looked like the suspension was damaged to me. But that's a huge, huge impact. You know, in previous times, if you go back to 2012, when uh, Fernando Alonso, who was in this race, um, had a big crash at Spa at the opening lap, and one of the cars went, in fact, it was Roman Grosjean, went over his head and scraped the top of his crash helmet. Yeah. I mean, he escaped death by millimetres. That was another reason, together with the death of Jules Bianchi in 2014 in Japan with head injuries. Uh, why they developed this safety system, the halo. And um, I know that you were saying it was slightly controversial at the beginning um, because when it was introduced, a lot of the aficionados thought it, it, it's ugly. Uh, the fans didn't like it because they couldn't see the drivers, they couldn't see their helmet properly. And Formula One is traditionally, it's about open wheel, open cockpit cars. So when they became more enclosed, the fans didn't like it. But since that time of introduction in 2018, it's proved its worth over and over again as an absolute lifesaver. Yeah, some suggestions that it should ha have the livery of the helmet um, on it for the driver, I'm sure, Joju, um, wouldn't care a jot about that, uh, given what it did. And, and just very quickly, I mean, it saved his life, didn't it? He walked away from that accident just by having to pop into the medical centre and he was fine. He was absolutely fine. He, he was better off than Alex Albon, who was pushed into the wall in that same crash um, by Sebastian Vettel. And he ended up in hospital for, for a short while. But again, yeah, Joe Guanyu was in the paddock uh, about three hours later after the race and Formula One officials were talking to him, saw him with team bosses, and, and then he went on social media to say, look, I'm fine, yeah. thanks for the concern. And just uh, quite remarkable. Absolutely. Um, and the safety cell of the car was, was brilliant. It was, Tony. Um, it was a great race, um, but thank goodness everybody was uh, safe. Didn't have time to talk to you about those um, trespassing on the track, but maybe we'll talk about that next time. Good to see you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us all today's top stories coming up for you in just a second.